Welcome everyone. Please join me in welcoming uh, Yang Zhan. Yang uh, is a faculty member at uh, the CISPAT Helmut Center for Information Security in uh, Saarland. He is a leading researcher working an intersection between uh, machine learning and uh, privacy. And he has uh, published in the last few years uh, quite a number of uh, seminal contributions in this field in the top security conferences and he has also received the distinguished paper awards in this field so i'm very excited to have you here young thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, without further ado i hand you over the floor all right so thanks for the introduction so i'm also very happy to give a talk here so today, my talk's name is Quantifying Privacy Risks of Machine Learning Models. Uh, yes, I will give up. I mean, I'm young and uh, I'm a faculty member at CISPA. So my research interest is uh, mainly three lines, meaning machine learning and security privacy, or nowadays people like to call it a trustworthy machine learning. I also work on social network mining or algorithm make fairness a bit. Or well, recently, I started work on a little bit on the online hate speech that is mainly a collaboration with uh, iDrama Lab. So today's talk will be constituted by three parts. The first one is membership inference. The second one is called data re reconstruction in the online learning setting. And the third one is uh, link stealing attacks against uh, GNN, so graph neural networks. So one of the very popular machine learning models nowadays. So let's start with membership inference. I think uh, it's uh, not new to any of you that machine learning nowadays is popular. So it's popular not only in academia, but also in our daily lives. So you can see machine learning has many, many different applications, and indeed the machine learning models become you know, more and more powerful. The major reason to drive this development is mainly you know, power, the algorithms, uh, the data, also the computing power, like the GPUs. And in many cases, these machine learning models are trained on I would say sensitive data or personalized data or per, your personal data. For example, let's say biomedical doctors or biomedical researchers are using a biomedical record to train a classifier, to, let's say to make a diagnosis. Or in many cases, even on your smartphone, they are actually use collect your keyboard input to try to improve the your you know your next uh, next word suggestion. So indeed, this is good because the thing is, a uh, machine learning model have more access to all kind of you know this kind of a sensitive data, it will make the model definitely be beneficial. I mean, benefit the model for being more powerful to make your, make your life easier. On the other hand, how about the privacy? In the sense that uh, machine learning models of this kind are trained on, let's say, sensitive people's data, uh, people's sensitive data. And this kind of data, we don't know actually whether machine learning models will leak this data. Yeah, so this is a, a bit different from the traditional data privacy, but here, your data is not you know, directly accessed to you, but actually accesses through a trained machine learning model. So this line of work on privacy of machine learning is basically investigate, I give you a machine learning model, whether you know, an attacker can infer information from the machine learning model. If an attacker is successful, then there's a privacy breach. Uh, I will give a very naive introduction about what machine learning is. So nowadays, what to do machine learning is you just get a data set from the internet, so you know public data set, and then you open PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, a couple of years ago TensorFlow, nowadays the PyTorch, and then you choose your favorite model, and then you train your model with your data. Once your model is trained, you get a, you know, a test sample or a couple of testing samples, you throw them to the model, and the model will give you, you know, output. So in this case, it's let's say machine learning classification, yeah, or image classification, uh, image classifier. Uh, for example, the image will tell you that okay, eighty percent is a panda, ten percent is a dog, ten percent is a cat. All right, so this, this is a very naive machine learning pipeline for machine learning classification pipeline. Uh, I'm talking about the first thing called membership inference is defined like this, very simple. So my goal here is I want to know whether a certain sample is a part of the machine learning model's training data or not. That's it. It's a binary choice. You are in it or not in it. And what the attacker can have access to, it's only the machine learning model itself. Of course, it does not have access to the original data set. Otherwise, you can just simply do a you know, table lookup. Uh, 
But machine learning, I have to mention the membership inference right now is the mainstream privacy attack against machine learning models. This is similar to, let's say, adversary example attacks against machine learning models for machine learning security. For machine learning security, you go for evasion attack, which is adverse example. For machine learning privacy, membership inference is you know, the most popular attack. Uh, I'm talking about our relatively old paper, so 2019, our first paper on, on membership inference. And, uh, uh, this is called MRDX at NDS 2019. So we are not the first one who do membership inference against machine models. The first paper I believe is from Reza Shokri back in Auckland 2017. So let's see how the attack works. So suppose uh, you have a target model, the target model is trained with a certain data set. Then so you have an attacker, the attacker locally has a data set, we call it a shadow data set. And this data set come from the same distribution as the target model training data set. Okay, and then what the attacker does is attacker split data into training and testing. Okay, like a standard setting. And then attacker use the training data set to train a set of shadow models, a bunch of shadow models. And here, the reason we call shadow model here is that because they are the shadow of the target model. So for example, if the target model is a cat, dog, panda classifier, my shadow model is a cat, dog, panda classifier as well. And also, we assume, or they assume that the shadow model and target model have, you know, share the same architecture. If the target model is a rest 50 my shadow model is also rest 50 Okay, once my shadow models are trained, our attacker's shadow model is trained, uh, what, they, what the attacker do is they throw both the training and the testing samples into the shadow models. Then you get a bunch of output. Yeah, you can call it the prediction confidence scores, or you can call it the posterior probability, or you can call it the posteriors. So for the sake of this talk, I will call them posteriors. And once you have all these posteriors, what the attacker does is attacker use the posterior to train an attack model. You can see all the process I'm, uh, the attacker is, uh, you know, have a shadow data set, train a shadow model and generate the posteriors. So all the, uh, for all this process, the purpose is only once, uh, one, that is generating data to train your attack model. Yeah, because here, what is training? What is training actually are the members? What is testing are the non-members for the shadow models? Okay, so once attacker generates this, it can train attack model. Attack model here, remember we are doing, sorry. Remember we are doing membership inference attack. My attack model is binary. A sample is a member and non-member. So once my attack model is trained, I have a sample. I want to know whether this sample is a part of the training data or not of the original target model. So I have this sample. I throw to the target model, target model gave me a posterior, and I throw the posterior to my trained attack model. The attack model tell me, okay, this image is a member, not member. Okay, so in this sense, this attack is also machine learning model itself, but the, what's a, a bit different from the you know, traditional machine, machine learning task is the training samples of this attack model are also from another training, uh, another machine learning model, which is shadow model. Okay, so basically, uh, not only membership inference. If nowadays you work on many, many different kinds of you know security or privacy problems, with machine learning models, this kind of architecture or this kind of scheme of training them are more or less similar. You always, in many cases, you need shadow models. So why you need shadow models? Because shadow model is established by the attacker themselves, which means the attacker have all the access to it, and the attacker know what is member, what is non member. So, which means you give the you know the labeled data to train the attack model. Okay, this is just Reza Shockley's attack. Uh, by the way, so this talk I forgot to mention. So I want it to be interactive. So, if you have any questions at any time, just feel free to open your microphone and ask. Okay. Uh, this yeah, Reza Shockley, I, I, just, yeah. just a quick, just a naive question on that. So, to yeah. to have a shadow model, does the attacker have uh, or an effective one? Let's say, does the attacker have to have access to the some out the training uh, specifics of the original target model. Training specifics, you mean, let's say, the hyperparameter of the model, let's say, for what kind of Yeah, parameters, uh, you know, algorithms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think here you, you can assume you have it. Yeah, so you can assume okay. you have it. So you use the same. Thing. But later I will show that actually this thing is not that necessary. Okay. Yeah, not only for management inference, but for many kind, different kinds of attacks. Okay, this is a really short attack. And uh, here, and uh, I mean, one reason I had to mention why membership inference works because you can see on my figure at the posteriors, the one with the you know the pink background and the one with the blue background. 
the blue background are the testing samples posterior, which is non-members posterior. And the red background are the member sample posterior. You can see the member sample posterior are more confident, yeah? Because the thing is, more, machine learning model has a you know, general well, property or weakness is called overfitting. So machine learning model tends to be more confident on samples it was trained on than you know, the new samples. Okay, and th this is the main reason that my machine friends attack can work or the attack model can't differentiate the member and non-member samples. Okay, and the reason short the attack has uh, like say three major assumptions. First, they assume the attacker has a data set coming from the same distribution as time model. Okay, and then it mentioned, they mentioned that uh, we need to train a bunch of shadow models and a bunch of attack models. You know, if you train more shadow models, you train more attack models, which means at least the attacker need more computing power. Yeah. So what we do in our paper is try to relax all these assumptions. So following this direction, so we did actually three attacks. Our first attack is very simple. It's a very simplified version of this one. So what we did is we simply replaced multiple shadow models and multiple attack models with one shadow model and one attack model. Okay, in that sense, attacker instead of training, you know, a hundred shadow models, one is enough. So let's see the experiment result. So I'm talking about the membership inference. It's a binary classification. A sample can be member or non-member. So the left figure is the attack, the binary classification, the precision, and right is recall. You can see that in most cases, I mean, in all the 13 data sets, if I'm not speak, mistaken, our attack, this one shadow model, one attack model result is similar to, you know, multiple shadow model and multiple attack model. But this is just a simple, you know, very simple relaxation. Uh, what is actually more, you know, strong, so what, what is more important although, what is a stronger assumption for the attacker is that you assume the attacker has a data set coming from the same intrusion as the target model training data set. Okay, so suppose you are attacking a model trained by Google and Google has some inside data set, maybe billions of photos. It is hard to, it is hard to require the attacker has the you know, same kind of data set as what Google has. So what we do here is try to relax this assumption. What we do is also actually simple. Um, you just need a different data set to train your shadow model, attack model. All the other process stay the same. This different data set does not even necessarily to be image. Okay, so if your target model here is an image, my local data set is actually a bunch of news articles. It's a natural language processing data set. If you do that, I mean, later I will explain why this works, but that's basically how, 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 how this uh, our attack tool is. Yeah? This is what, what our attack tool is. Uh, this thing also links back to Mateo's question a bit. So here, since you are facing a different data set now, your shadow model does not need to be similar to Perry model. Perry model, let's say, is a convolutional neural network that's designed specifically for images. And then your shadow model here, since you are doing natural language processing tasks, uh, if you're doing classification, you can use MRP or you can use more of the ones to transform the models like a BERT or GPT-2. Uh, okay, so let's see the result. Left is precision, right is recall. Everything on the diagonal of the two matrices are the attack of the attack one, which is the shadow model, tiny model coming from the same distribution. Everything off the diagonal are the transferring attack. Yeah, so you are using different data sets to transfer different data set. Darker the color, better the performance. So from here, you can actually see that uh, many cases, of course, diagonal in general works better, but however, many, you know, points of the diagonal also have a good performance, which means in many cases, this transferring attack can work. Okay, it sounds a bit like magic, but how why this works? So the reason is actually also quite quite a, quite simple, I would say, yeah? Recall, so the input to our attack model, the input to the target model or input to the uh, shadow model, let's say input to the target model is an image, but the input to the attack model is not the image itself. It's the posterior from the target model. Yeah, so here on the left figure, I did a TSNE or TSNE plot, which means I make a, let's say if I take top five posteriors, I make it to two dimensions with some you know, data visualization tools that are called TSNE. Uh, I make it to two dimensions. So here you can see all different uh, marks. There are CIFAR 10, uh, CIFAR 100 and news data set. So far, 100 is an image data set and the news is a natural language processing data set. So left is a you know, 3D matrix or tensor, right is a bunch of strings. 
you can see the members and the non uh, members from both Cypher 100 and News are lying in the similar you know region. So as non member of these two data sets, and here this is the this is the TSNE plot of the input to the attack model. Yeah. So which means that if I'm able to learn, let's say, on my shadow model, I'm able to separate the CIFR 100 member, non-member well. And this one can also easily separate the news and you know, news member, non-member. So what is eventually the reason is that we didn't transfer the data set here. We transfer the overfitting behavior. So no matter what kind of models, well, not no matter, it's too, too absolute, I guess. So in many cases, if two models are both overfitted, then if you throw the corresponding or respective member sample to them individually or separately, they will have a similar kind of posterior behavior. Yeah, that's why. So if I locally, I can learn to separate the CIFAR member and non-members, this one can automatically be transferred to the new state set to separate member and non-members. Okay, so this is the, you know, the, the, the attack tool. And then, but this one, note that this one, I still need to train on shadow models, I train attack models. As I mentioned in the very beginning of this talk, so membership in friends, the major reason it works is because of so-called overfitting behavior. So can we do it even simpler? So that's our third attack, it's super simple. So I don't have any shadow model attack model anymore. All I do is I have an image, I throw to the target model, target model gave me a posterior, and then, I set a threshold. I find a, I mean, I, I propose, we propose a threshold picking algorithm to find the threshold on the highest posterior value. Here is, let's say, highest posterior value is 80%. This is kind of thing. So if my posterior is 0.7, yeah, and then my height is 0 0.8, so 0 0.8 is bigger than 0 0.7, so which means this sample is a member. Okay, so that's it. I mean, I don't have much time to talk about how to choose the threshold. But actually, there's a many uh, there's some ways you could you know relatively confidently determine or, or accurately determine what is a suitable threshold. So this attack is the simplest because attacker all you need to do is the attacker have an image, query target model gets posterior, and from this posterior you can somehow judge you know whether it's a member sample or non-member sample. Okay, so I have talked about the three attacks. These three attacks left the precision relative recall. You can see the attack one and attack two have similar performance. Yeah, as I already showed it before, I think. Attack three, so the precision might be a bit weaker than the respiratory one and two, but uh, the recall is much higher. Yeah, so which means if we further tweak the threshold choosing mechanism, yeah, so the performance of three is more or less similar. So what this shows is and the, remember that attack one require more knowledge, attack two you re, require less knowledge, and the address three, address three basically need very few knowledge. And even you have very minimal knowledge, you can still make the attack work. This means the membership inference is a much easier task to be, a much easier attack to be mount than previously thought. Yeah? And uh, this also means the threat of membership inference is you know, higher. Okay, so this is just a very quick uh, fresh off introduction about what the membership inference is. I will talk about our recent works of uh, you know, membership inference, or more, more than once membership inference. So, so far, all the attack we talk about, all the attack we talk about, we require, I mean, we assume the target model give you the posterior as output, and this output will be used as the input to the attack model. But in many cases, in the online platform, if you're checking this machine learning as a service website like Google Cloud or Amazon, I don't know what Amazon's or whatever uh, machine learning API they have there, normally you give an image is there, they will only give you a label. But instead of telling you 80% this is a panda, they will tell you this is a panda. In that case, can we still do my machine inference? Because if you, I only give you a label, this label itself is only a one bit of information. It cannot tell you whether this model, this image is overfitted on the model or not. Can we still do membership inference? So uh, it turns out it's still possible. So we actually, this is the paper we published two, one month or two months ago at CCS. Uh, it's called membership inference in label only exposure. So there's also a concurrent work by Nicholas Paper and Nicholas Collini 
at all. Uh, they published uh, the paper in SML, I think, last year as well. Uh, we use a quite similar approach, I would say. Yeah? So in our paper, we have two approaches. The first, pro the first approach is the transfer-based attack. So what we do is, uh, of course, you, you assume we have, we assume the attacker has a data set, and you can assume the attacker have a data set and attacker delete or shadow, this shadow data set, and attacker ignore all the labels of this shadow data set. And then attacker use his shadow data set to query, this is not training, uh, this is to query the target model. And target model will, of course, give label to my data. So in this sense, we, we use target model as a labeling machine. Now I have a bunch of images, I source them to target model, target model will give all the labels to these images. Okay, I'm just using target model as a labeling machine. Since target, target model here only give me labels, it does not give me a posterior. So I just use the target model to complete my data set, yeah, or label my data set. Once I have this, I do exactly the same thing as my attack one in the previous uh, attack one I talked about. It's training, testing, one shadow model, and then I get the posteriors and train one attack model. Okay, so this is so far the same as attack one. And then what is more interesting now is when I do the final attack. So once my attack model is trained, my binary membership inference attack model is trained, what I do next is I have an image, I throw it to the shadow model. Remember, in our previous attack, we throw the image to the target model. But here, you can, of course, also throw the image to the target model. But here, the target model will only give you a label, not the posterior anymore. But however, if I throw my image into my shadow model, my shadow model will definitely give me posteriors because the shadow model is established by me. And then I throw the posterior to my attack model. The attack model will tell me it's a member or non-member. OK, there's a one critical point I have to make. I mean, one thing I have to emphasize, my shadow model here, is not used, I mean, it's not the train of the sample I'm interested in. Okay, so this sample itself actually is completely non-member for the shadow mode. Yeah, but why this attack can work? Yeah, so why this attack can work? Because the labeling process for data, no label data set to target model to the data set, the first three steps, I'm using my data set to observe enough information from the target model. And then if my data set already has the information for the target model, and then my shadow model, and then the shadow model is you know, the shadow model it trends also has enough similarity to the target model. So in that sense, if my sample is uh, let's say a member on target model, it should be also have a similar kind of member style posterior on my shadow model. Yeah, so the key here is only on the labeling part with the target model. So once this is done, so uh, this is the first attack we did. And uh, the second attack we did is also, as I mentioned, is similar to the concurrent work by, by paper not at all. So what we did is, uh, there's one thing I mentioned before that the, the default attack of uh, machine learning security is so-called the evasion attack or other examples. In other examples, you know, what you do is uh, if you have three image target model, tell me it's a panda. And then other example is I'm adding some other adversarial and human imperceptible noise on the image. And this image, so to the target model, target model will misclassify. This is just a, uh, this is just a perturbation. This is just a evasion attack. This is just an adversarial example, yeah? And here, which means that if the target model only give me a label, anyway, I can do an adversarial example on it, uh, on, on, on my image. I'm interested in whether this is a member or not. So here, our, Let's say our central observation or our hypothesis is that to perturb a member sample, uh, to perturb a member sample to be misclassified by target mode is harder than perturbing a non-member sample. So what this can be reflect is that for two images, one is member, one, one is non-member, I can do other examples both on the target model. And then the noise I added added on the member sample is larger than the noise added on the non-member sample. Okay, this is our hypothesis. We also have analysis that shows that actually this is indeed the case. And we're using the difference of this, uh, the difference of the magnitude of the original noise added on the image as an indicator to see whether a sample is a member or non-member. 
Okay, this is the second attack. Because here, again, when we try all these efforts, it's only because the tire model only gave us a label. It does not give us posterior. If we have a posterior, life will be much easier. So we have some, uh, you know, re result on the transfer based and perturbation based attack. Compared to our previous attack on VSS uh, 2019 paper, you see the performance uh, more or less similar. Some cases, our attack is worse. Sometimes, sometimes our attack is even better. Even our attack in this case is better than the traditional posterior based attack, but I have to emphasize one thing. This attack is really expensive to perform compared to pre previous one, because we assume we have a black box access to the target model. For the perturbation attack, if you work on those examples, if you want to do other example for image on a black box model, you need a lot of number of queries. You need to add a lot of noise. You need to have a lot of interaction with target model. This, you know, this, this training budget or the whole effort we need to spend is much, much higher than, you know, the, 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 than the white box case. So in that sense, even though this attack can work, but however, it's still not perfect because to get a one, one sample of memory inference, you really need to spend a lot of effort. This is uh, our label only membership inference. Yeah. And uh, then I will talk about another work we published last year at CCS regarding use membership inference to an uh, interesting attack. Uh, everyone here, I'm pretty sure know you guys hear about a notion called GDPR. And we, among, I mean, of course, I'm not that familiar with, I'm not that familiar with GDPR. But the one notion or one central notion in GDPR is so-called the right to be forgotten. Yeah, so in this case, uh, suppose I have a target model trained with four people's data, and one, one day this guy with the red hair does not want their data to be used in the trained model anymore. I need to do something called machine and learning. Yeah, so I, need, I can request, let's say, Google to remove my data from your model. Yeah, this so-called machine and learning process. Of course, there are many, you know, there's a very active area of machine learning nowadays, and uh, people propose many ways for how to do machine learning. But the most legitimate way or most straightforward way is I just delete this, this person, this user, single user data, and then I train my model from scratch again. Yeah, this is by definition the most you know, straightforward way to do machine learning. All right, so this is a machine learning process, but uh, suppose if my target model, my original target model is perfectly not overfitted, not overfitted, which means originally this person's data is hard. If I throw this person's data to the original target model, it will give me almost the perfect posterior for all the four classes or whatever multiple classes. Yeah. So it, anyway, that, in, in that case, it's hard for us to perform membership inference on the original target model. Okay. However, now my unlearned model, if I use the same person data to pair up my unlearned model again, since my unlearned model already deleted this person's data, the posterior will somehow have some difference. And it turns out this two posterior difference can serve as a strong indicator, indicator to guess this person is a member of the original target model. In that sense, so you're doing machine and learning is, uh, let's say, counterproductive. You know, in the sense that I want to do machine and learning to protect my privacy, but however, at least for my membership privacy in the original model is pretty good. But once you do machine and learning, it turns out your membership privacy get worse. Yeah, so this is something we will discover. Yes, Yang, here you're yeah. assuming that uh, the, um, the attacker has access, let's say, before and after the yes. Yes. Phase, no? Yes, we will mm -hmm. assume that. And uh, to assume, I mean, this is, a, this is a relatively okay assumption. So I think relatively re realistic because the thing, if you target a machine learning model on the cloud, you can keep on querying the model every day. You can keep, keep on querying the model every day. So, I mean, anyway, all model will change from time to time. So, and uh, you can always have the, you know, access to the old one. Uh, I mean, you, you have the image, you store to the old one, you can record the result. And then the new one can also record the result. Okay, so which means that a membership inference here also can use as a tool to find the possible, let's say, weakness or flaws in the notion of machine learning. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm finding a flaw for the notion of GDPR, but uh, you know, for machine learning, if you not do it the right way, uh, it can be counterproductive. I mean, uh, like. Uh, 
make it make situation worse, so you saw, which means you are not protecting privacy, but you are destroying privacy. All right, uh, this is the machine learning part. So yeah, this is the result here. So the higher bar in the left figure, so the higher the, the bar with the uh, color, the higher color corresponding to the darker, I mean, lighter color bar seems so higher the value, better the performance of the machine learning compared to the original memory inference subject. Okay, uh, I don't have the detail to, to, I don't have time to go to the details of the, the, the experiment result. So I will talk about memory inference we have in my lab, we, we did a lot of memory machine inference work. So besides that, we, as I mentioned, we did label only. We also did, uh, let's say, recommender system. Turns out the recommender system, the memory machine inference, because recommender system is probably one of the most frequent machine learning model we have access to or interact with every day. If you go to Amazon, you get the recommended items. Yeah? Turns out the recommender system, the memory machine privacy is also very easy to mount. Uh, there's also uh, the next one, contrast models. Uh, Last for the let's say two years ago, I guess. So the most popular notion, or last year, the most popular notion in machine learning community is called contrastive learning. This is the one of the most popular self-supervised learning method that is being very active area in machine learning. It turns out that uh, in their case, the memory inference on contrastive models are less severe compared to the normal classifiers. But however, other kinds of privacy attack, like attribute inference attack, the performance is worse. Uh, so this this new kind of models have you know weird behavior, is it? or or a general another way. So most of the current memory inference attack focus on the image classifiers, but however, image classifier is probably we security people understand machine learning, or 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 our where we security people, so our we are not really machine learning researchers. So machine learning has very many many new fancy models and more development. Turns out this new development, this new model of privacy risks. Is also different from you know the traditional image classifiers, and then we also did something on graph neural networks on that. Anyway, so all this paper is on my website. So if you have a, you know if you are interested, you can you can take a look. Uh, I will also talk about some future of memory inference with my personal perspective. Uh, as I mentioned, memory inference is the is the default privacy attack against machine learning. Model. Yeah, it definitely is the most uh, you know popular one. But however, till today. Has been developed for four years, I think, this attack. But till today, this attack cannot uh, work well on perfectly generalized model. Yeah, so it's normally if you have a really a state of the model, memory inference performance really, you know, like random guessing. Second thing is that uh, we, we don't know whether this really works on the real world model deploy on the cloud. The reason we, we don't know is because you can't do attack on Google's model, but Google will never tell you whether the sample is indeed a member or not member. This you probably need access to a company resource and company data set, you will know. But this is something that uh, as far as I know hasn't hasn't been fully demonstrated or demonstrated in large scale. Maybe some small scale data set, yes. Uh, or small companies classified, yes. And then the experiment the setup of memory inference is a bit also a bit problematic because the thing is uh yes, I don't have time much time to talk about this. But the thing is when you train your attack model. Your membership sample is very clear. That is the data in your training data set. For your bio, for your non-member, uh, currently at least the most paper I know, they are still assume the non-member is from the same data set, but just not used to train model. In my case, it just in our case, I just mentioned they, a data set coupled to training and testing, you use the testing as the non-member data. But however, any data in the on the internet in the world should be considered non-member data. So actually we did some uh, interesting experiments to show that uh, you can throw a random image or even take one of my selfie, I throw to a model trained on CFR10, sometimes my tech model still considers this as a member. Yeah. So this uh, this experiment setup theory is still also not, not uh, complete. Uh, another thing is uh, we, we need the new attack models. So I think there's uh, some recent effort uh, um, by, by let's say Facebook AI, I think that they did some new attacks on memory inference which relies on more fancy technique, uh, the tech techniques and seems that the, 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 the attack method is more promising than the current one we are using. And uh, well, another thing to mention is that memory inference, since they're becoming so popular, it can be used for other fancier attacks. Like uh, you can use memory inference as a data reconstruction someday. Yeah? And then you can also use this. This is memory inference itself is not, can, cannot only, I mean, 
doesn't have to be from a, a bad perspective, a malicious perspective. A, a normal user, you can also use memory machine inference to check whether a certain machine model uses your data or not. You can basically use it, use it as a tool for audit. Yeah, so this is some my, my personal thoughts about memory machine inference. Uh, I think that uh, again, I'm horribly behind my talk schedule. So I will continue to my second part of my talk. Yeah? So that is a uh, data reconstruction the online learning setting. So yes, first sentence, yes, data is the key for driving machine learning development and new data lead machine learning model, you know, uh, new data is being generated at every second. For example, we are recording my talk right now and this data later we put on YouTube is the new data we are generating here. What this means is that whenever you train a powerful machine learning model, maybe in one week or in two days, your model will be outdated because your model didn't learn the new data that happened in the past two days or past week. So what uh, in industry, what people do is you need to update your model from time to time, just like to update your, just like uh, updating your operating system. Okay, so you update the model, how do you update your model? You have a model trend, when you have a new data coming in, you just fine tune your model a bit. Yeah, you just fine tune your model. Same training algorithm, maybe less number of epochs, and then you train a model. In that sense, your model observes the new, new, you know, new information from the new data. So we're thinking this kind of thing called online learning. Yeah? So your model is training on the fly, basically, uh, all the time, keep on being updated. We're seeing whether this one, this, this online learning can, can be a new possible attack surface. So what I mean by that, so you have a Terry model, I have a Terry model, and today I throw an image of Terry model, I get a posterior, and tonight, the company who is behind this model collects some new data. Then so tonight, it let its their engineers to you know update the model. Tomorrow, if I use the same exact image of the current model, I will get a different result. The reason I get different result is because my model parameter has been changed with respect to the new data that they use to update the model. Yeah. And you have you have so-called posterior difference. So actually, it's a research question we ask, or the possible attack first way surface we can imagine. The way we imagine actually is whether this posterior difference, which means the same image, the different output from the same model, can be used or can be reverse engineered to guess the information of the data set used to update the model. Because this updating data set is the only reason my model gave different output. My different worship the model gave different output for the same image. Okay, so basically that's what we do. And this paper was published uh, well, nowadays, two years ago, I guess, using security 2020 update stick. Yang, is uh, it related to the, um, to the attack you should before on and Yes, yes, yes. But uh, this was basically the same, but however, uh, I will, later I will show you the result of how we did this attack. But uh, this one, in this one, we didn't do memory machine first because here in this one, we tackle some more challenging attack. Yeah, so memory machine inference, uh, it's, uh, yes, it's a different set of attacks. That's why we're attacking, we're trying to do something bigger or more challenging. Uh, in that case, uh, we have a general attack pipeline. So we have a problem data set. We store two time model and get a bunch of positive. That's my general attack pipeline. Yeah. And then once my model is updated with updating set, yeah, this red, red, red updating set is not known to the attack. Okay. And then, Next version of the model, I use the same problem set, same sequence to query time model. I get the posterior, and then I have two really long posterior vectors. Yeah, and then I calculate their difference. I build something called the encoder and decoder, encoder and decoder. So I encode this posterior difference to a lower dimension, and I actually in this paper we did four different attacks. None of them are memory inference. Today I only talk about the last one, which is the most the, the most difficult one. That is. Uh, multi sample reconstruction. So there are many details in the paper, but however, the encoder part, I mean, the first of all, the posterior difference is just a long vector. It's just a huge long vector. Um, and this uh, encoder here is just a multi-layer neural network. So you can call it multi-layer perceptual. Uh, and then the decoder, we have four different attacks. We have four different decoders. So here, the encoder decoder is just a general notion. Yeah? So the decoder here for the multi sample attack is, uh, I, I will introduce in a minute. So multi sample reconstruction. Our goal here is reconstruct the complete data set yeah, of the updating set. Yeah? So I'm not reconstructing the complete data set of the training data set, but only the data set used to update the model. 
So our notion, our general notion, our general intuition we have for this attack is so-called from distribution to samples. So we believe that if you manage to learn the distribution of the updating set, if I have the distribution of the updating set, with the distribution, I can keep on sampling new samples out. With, I can keep on generate samples out. And these samples, and then I do some post-processing, these samples will somehow similar to the updating set itself. Okay, so I get distribution, and from distribution, I can sample enough that sample it out, and then I do some post-processing. Basically, this is our attack of general notion. This is our attack of general process. Uh, the thing nowadays, so if you're familiar with machine learning, so nowadays when you talk about I'm learning a distribution, the first the two come to your mind is the generative of two networks, which is GAN. Yeah, so in, in our case, we propose a, a new variant of GAN called CBM GAN to actually do this attack. So what do we do with following? So I will, I will give a very naive introduction about what GAN is. So GAN, this is the original GAN. Yeah? So ignore the latent part on the slides. Uh, this is the original GAN. The GAN is composed by two neural networks. One is called the generator, the other is called discriminator. Discriminator here is only a binary classifier. Yeah, it's a binary image classifier. The generator here, the input is a vector, which is a, it can be a Gaussian noise vector, and output is an image. The goal of the generator is generate images as real as possible. And the goal of the discriminator is to, to, to separate the real image and the fake images as perfect as possible. In the, sense, in the sense that the discriminator and the generator are competing against each other. The sort of like a, a game theoretical way of modeling machine learning. And then if you keep on training both of them at the same time, simultaneously, in the end, both of them will converge. And then show, turns out that this generator will generate enough high quality image that, it, that are completely fake. Yeah, so, so nowadays, if you're interested in deep fake research, so again, the generator is your tool to generate a lot of deep fake images. All right, this is the original GAN. So what we did is our CBM GAN. So we have the posterior difference from the propping set from the target models two versions. We encode it to a latent vector and then we pad or concatenate the latent vector with the noise of the original GAN, throw them both as the input to the generator. And then we modify the loss function of the generator bit. So we add one thing called the best match loss. This loss is not complicated. Also, you can charge it from the writing of the formula. So basically it says for each sample in the updating set here, we assume, of course, I, I ignore many details, but in order to do this, to train this model, we also need a shadow data set, a shadow updating set. So basically here it says for each sample in the shadow updating set, I'm trying to let my G, which is the generator, generate the sample as real, as close as to the each sample in the shadow data set. So I'm letting my generator to learn every sample in my shadow updating set. Once this is done, and the, the second part, which is log dx uh, hat, that part is just a standard uh, GAN loss to, to try to minimize the discriminator loss actually, or increase the discriminator loss. But the first part is important. So I'm letting my GAN, my generator has the ability to map or build a connection between the posterior difference and the shadow updating set. And once I have this, I can apply this to the target model. I really want to infer the, you know, the what your data set really looks like. Uh, yes, of course, uh, time limit. I don't have much time to talk about details. I have show you quickly one one page si slides of a result. I'm doing a very simple data set called Amnist, one of the classical data set. So in here, I assume my target model is updated with 100 images. Okay, each image, each image itself is a number here. Yeah? Each image itself is a number here. So on these slides, I have 200, I have 200 images. All the first column are the real data set that use for update model. All the second column is the ones that I use, uh, reconstructed from my you know, CBM GAN. It turns out in many cases, the shape or, or you know, the, the numbers looks quite similar to the real ones. So in that sense, of course, this one is not perfect. Data reconstruction in general is a very hard problem. Probably it's the hardest problem for privacy attack against machine learning models. Yeah. Uh, but however, you can, in, in this is on this simple data set. Fact, uh, because this paper, we 
data in 2019, that time the GAN capability is not as powerful as nowadays GAN. That time there's no style GAN 3. I'm not sure there's style GAN 2 back then. Anyway, you can see that uh, here our image, the shape looks also relatively similar to the original ones, which means what I was trying to say here is the, the notion we use for this, uh, the, 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 the intuition behind this attack, that is from distribution to samples might work. Of course, we want to develop this further with more fancy attack, but still many of these things that is uh, you know, going on with, uh, it, it's still, it's, it's, we're, we're still working on this topic a bit. But uh, for, for maybe, maybe some students here who work on gas, you know that this generator model is not really easy to train. So in many cases, you use a lot of effort. Yeah, so in many cases, you still don't get the ideal result. Okay, so this in general concludes my second part of my talk. So I have like a, probably five minutes for my last part. This is our, one of our newest work on graph neural networks. So on the left side, you can consider this as a, you know, traditional machine learning models. Yeah, you have each sample is served with DNA, DNA the output. This is also a very, we are computer scientists. We like graphs. We like to model everything to graphs. And then there's, a, of course, and then there's a special graph neural network, uh, there's special neural networks that's automatically designed for handling graph data. So on my graph data here, each node has the features, and then I also have the connection of all the samples. For example, it can be a social network, it can be a, let's say, a Bitcoin transaction network, whatever transaction network you have, or whatever transportation networks. It turns out GNN is a very popular model in machine learning field in general. And I know many leading companies actually inside, they also have a large scale graph data. They are using GNNs all the time to you know, process their data. So very powerful model. And also one nice thing, if you I advocate you guys work on to study more on the security privacy of GNN problem, one easy thing is that the GN models normally is quite small compared to the image model. So it's could kill you less GPUs. So your experiment result probably, I mean, your experiment process will be faster. Anyway, so the left is a uh, normal neural network, the right is a uh, GN, yeah? And uh, GN, there are you know, different, two different kinds. One is called transductive and the other is inductive. So transductive is a, it's a bit like a semi-supervised learning. So in this case, when you train the model, your whole graph, and each node the features are used already to train the model. What is only missing in the whole graph is this blue and red points label. Yeah, I don't know that what, what they are, but I can use their features as well to train the model. Yeah, this is called transdag with GN. Uh, once, when I, once the model is trained, my goal here is only to predict the label of the blue points, the label of the red points. What I do is I just throw the ID not the feature, the ID of the blue points to the GN model. The model will give me a prediction. So why can I throw the ID, not the feature, because the feature is already known by the GN model. Yeah, so while I throw the ID, the GN can do a lookup, can do a look up in his, uh, you know, in the structure. You know what, what model, I mean, what node I'm referring to and then you can give me a prediction. This is a bit different from the, you know, the traditional inductive machine learning setting. You have a training data set, testing data set, they're all connected. Here in the trust type setting, there are somehow, you know, they are, they, are, they are somehow mixed together, but uh, the only amazing thing is the labels. Okay, so this is the, the transdiagonal setting GNN. Uh, and our research question here is, of course, we have a security privacy or privacy angle for this GN model. It's now, I have two nodes. Uh, they gave me two posteriors from the model. Can I, from this posterior, infer whether there is a link between these two nodes? Yeah, because the thing I'm, I'm, I'm targeting the most valuable information of GN, which is the graph structure. Yeah, if you don't have the graph structure, you can just use a normal machine model to train it. Graph structure is what this thing, uh, what makes the GN model different from others. Okay, and then we'll see whether we can use this only the output of this thing to infer the link, which means we can even try to reconstruct the GN, I mean, the graph structure from a black box GN model. Okay, remember the input of the GN model is only ID. You don't need to throw any graph inside for the transductive setting. You know? For the inductive setting is different, but uh, we don't have time to talk about this today here. So this is a paper by uh, my student uh, Shin Lee He, so also UCX 2021, last year. Uh, in this paper, so instead of you know, focus on a specific scenario, we, we basically summarize all the possible dimension of knowledge our attacker ha has. So our summary includes the attacker can has all the known feature of the target model. It can has a real partial graph of the real graph, yeah, of the training target graph. 
you can also have a shadow data set. This is uh, the three possible dimension of knowledge. We assume the attacker, we do it comprehensively. We assume the attacker can, has, can have each of this knowledge. In total, there's like a, you know, three different kinds of knowledge. Each one you can have it or you cannot have it. In the end, we have eight combination. Yeah? We have eight combination strand model things. So in the end, we design eight different attacks for these different eight different scenarios. So today I will talk about a very simple one. The first one that says we assume the attacker does not have any information, does not have no feature, no partial graph, no shadow data set. Then I just throw the two IDs inside, I get two posteriors. And then I want to know whether two nodes are linked or not. So you probably can already guess this attack, I mean, this attack can work and how do you do this attack? All you need to do is basically calculate the posterior difference of this thing. Basically, based on the intuition is uh, that if two nodes are connected, their posteriors on current model should be similar. Yeah, if two nodes are really far away from each other, they are not connected in the graph, the posterior should be quite different. From this, we can basically tell you know, what's the, whether this is a, there's a link between two nodes, or, uh, these two nodes or not. So this is our simplest attack, uh, but it's unsupervised because you don't have the label data trained at all. But uh, our another attack, we have from attack zero to attack seven. So I just talk about attack zero. Now I'll talk about attack three, which is another attack to do a presentation about. It says we assume we have some uh, graph, ground truth graph of a partial graph from the real graph of the GN model. So we can do this again. We can calculate the posterior difference. But since we have the partial graph, we have some sort of ground truth, part of the ground truth. I mean, you, I can use the part of ground truth to train a classifier to determine whether two nodes are connected or not. But the general intuition of the attack three and attack zero are the same. If two nodes are connected, their posteriors are also similar. Yeah, and, then this, and if two nodes are not connected, there's no edge between them. Their posteriors are relatively different compared to those that are connected. And uh, this is the general evaluation result. So what the main message take away from this uh, figure is that uh, we have different attacks. Of course, attack seven has more knowledge, attack zero has least knowledge. In general, more knowledge leads to better attack, but this is not always the case because one type of uh, knowledge, which is a shadow data set, doesn't help much, doesn't help much. You know? And uh, what is also more important is our attack here, from attack zero to attack seven. All, I mean, more, many of them in many data sets all perform the link, traditional link prediction task. Yeah, because when you do the traditional link prediction, if you work on social network mining, so link prediction is you just get the graph data, you just guess whether two nodes are linked or not. The information for link prediction is only from the graph itself. Our attack rely on the output of the GN. Yeah, so you see our attack is better than link prediction. This means the GN itself leaked extra information than before. Which means, again, so as I said, another example, GN model is a popular, popular machine model, but when people design it with all the privacy or security in mind, it actually, in many cases, can damage people's privacy. So I think that's uh, it for my talk. We also have some other, uh, again, so I advocate you guys to work on more on the GN security privacy. First of all, GN is really popular. And many people are using GN to do many security related tasks, like uh, what I just mentioned, the transaction fraud detection, social network fault detection, et cetera. Uh, but uh, there are many things we haven't been, well, we, we, in our lab, we have done some work on, on this direction as well, but there are many things we haven't done yet. And GN is still a very, right, security privacy of GN is still a relatively new field. Uh, and another thing, as I mentioned before, GN model is much smaller compared to ResNet. So it's much faster to train when you do your experiment. Anyway, so and the last thing I will also propose, I mean, promote one of uh, the software toolkit we, we have done in our lab, we call it MR Doctor. Uh, because we are talking about many different attacks, uh, reconstruction, you know, many other people did, you know, model stealing, attribute inference, model inversion. People normally do one attack for one model, one attack for one model. But we don't know what's the connection of all these models. Yeah, what's the relation between this model? Because in the end, I can say this model is private or more, this model is secure in terms of membership inference, but this is not what people really want. They just want to hear the model is secure against all kinds of possible attacks. So basically so following this uh, idea or intuition, we, we build this thing called MR Doctor. So we assemble four different most representative, uh, representative uh, inference attacks in the machine learning security privacy domain. 
membership in France, actually in France, more than Russia, more than Spain. We combine them together. And then if we, in the future, some of you guys work out, want to work on this paper, uh, work on this direction, you know, also feel free to use our tool here. So because then we can assemble all the attacks together and we can also analyze the synergy of different attacks, you know, which so far hasn't been heavily investigated. Uh, I think that's it for my talk. And again, the last page uh, is, I would thank, like to thank all my students and uh, collaborators for their help. So with all, with all their contributions, so what I'm talking about today won't be possible. Okay, I think that's it for my talk. Again, so I'm uh, right on time, but <laughs> like we still have, have like a three minutes Q&A or something. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Yang, for the fascinating uh, talk. Very, very, very inspiring. Um, so does the audience uh, have a question? Uh, just feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, hello. Uh, I, I would have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question would be related to your first part about membership uh -huh. inference attack. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask uh, if you have a feeling or knowledge <laughs> about uh -huh. what is the nature of this attack. Is this more like model driven or data driven or bot? And does the overfitting of the model uh, maybe also plays a role in the success of this attack? So uh, the second part, of it, the overfitting probably is the major role to make this attack work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And regarding whether this thing comes from the model or data itself, I think it can be both, but no one actually have investigated if a model is uh, vulnerable to memory inference, it's more because the model is too simple or because the too, data is too difficult. Because if the data is too difficult to classify, the model turns to be more likely to be overfitting. This is a very good question, but I don't think people have uh, ever investigated. If you want me to guess now, I guess both things contributes to a certain extent, but uh, probably data itself will also play an interesting role, more, more mm -hmm. important role than model itself. Because nowadays, yeah. the more more or less the model have a similar, you know, expressive expressive power, but uh, the data, if some data is really hard to classify, then the model when they learn this data, they have to somehow remember it. Yeah, that's the only thing they can do. It's hard for them to generalize. Then memory inference is more severe for this sample. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, true. Actually, came across recently uh, to a paper which was saying that uh, the Membership of outliers is easier to infer True. than the membership of the yep. uh, like other data. And uh, the next question would be about the defense mechanisms. Like, mm -hmm. uh, do do you see any I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, defenses which could really help? Yeah, so there's of support. course there are many many defense work on this domain of membership defense. So in my lab, I also collaborated with uh, Neil Gong from Duke University. We did something called MemGuard. And of course, many people have said you can use different privacy to, 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 to mitigate this uh, membership inference because at least the theoretical point of view or the definition point of view of this tool, you know, membership inference should be easily mitigated by different privacy. This is uh, true, but however, for different privacy, currently all the methods to use to train a differently, differentially private machine learning model will inevitably, uh, will inevitably make the model perform worse in the real mm -hmm. task, which means the model utility drop is too significant. So different privacy, I think that uh, if some point, someday people propose a more advanced or more fancier way of, or more effective way of, of implementing different privacy on machine learning models, different privacy should be able to mitigate this attack. Should be. Uh, with a, a, but the right now, the current DP on uh, machine learning, which means mainly DPSGD doesn't work that well, actually. Mm -hmm. And besides differential privacy, there are no uh, uh, really other technologies which seem to work. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I personally, I don't, I, I don't work exactly on mm -hmm. differential privacy. So, but at mm -hmm. least uh, that from our labs, the empirical experience. So, if you apply DPSGD, uh, first of all, it's hard to apply DPSGD on the real large scale state of art machine learning models. Yeah, in many cases, the type of will tell you all the memory or something. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. second thing is that even you make it work, so. If you want to have a meaningful epsilon, like a, let's say epsilon 0 
So your model is basically, you know, the original utility is mm -hmm. basically like a random guess. Yeah, you, you, you might do that. So that's it's still not perfect zero. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, may I also like the last question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's more like a general uh, regarding uh -huh. like the uh, evaluation of the membership inference attack. Uh -huh. So as far as I understand, uh -huh. um, how is it happening now? You just like perform the attack and you say with this precision or accuracy, we know that this yep. sample can like can be a member. But like what? precision of accuracy attack of attack is actually enough or not enough so if 70 percent is good or not like how and if you try to apply different defenses how do you get are, are there any works like discussing the uh, this kind of problem this is a definitely always good question how good is a classifier mm -hmm. it always depends yeah. on the scenarios yeah so but uh there's also a recent work by florian tremor at all it's on archive last year, December, I think. You can check that paper. Mm -hmm. In that paper, they first, uh, they argue that uh, what is a more meaningful metric for membership inference is not accuracy, but is uh, when you have a low first time positive rate, you can check the true positive rate. Yeah, so basically, you can mm -hmm. have an ROC curve. If I remember correctly, if you have ROC curve, you go to the left the bottom. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I lower first positive, so I want to keep my first positive low, I want to see how high my true positive rate is. They argue that that might be a better way, which might be true, well, or, but still not that there's no consensus in the community, what is the best metric. Uh, and of course, regarding membership inference, sometimes your membership inference classifier can be totally random guess. But however, depending on scenario, if I'm only interested in, let's say one person's data, and my classifier can guess this one person's data super well, yeah, then my attack is still successful. Yeah, if I'm doing a, let's say a specific target of one sample. Mm -hmm. So this is again, it's a very good question, but uh, I, I can only point you to the paper by Florian Trammer, but uh, yeah, I could, personally could you please just say again the name of the paper uh, uh, or, or the author uh, of the author? You can search Florian Trammer. Okay, thank you. From yeah, ETH, uh, I think. Uh, from ETH, you can, you can check it. So okay. It's an archive mm -hmm. of December last year. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Great. Are there other questions? Okay, last chance. All right, so then since we are running out, uh, actually we ran out of time already. Um, I would like to thank uh, Yang really thanks again uh, for, for accepting the invitation, for giving us uh, this great talk. And uh, hopefully, you know, we will meet in person soon and uh, we will invite you uh, physically to Vienna uh, yeah. 